Well, man, another Thanksgiving has happened. A Thanksgiving holiday is gone, and we've been through that, and now we've even been through Black Friday. You know, we got Cyber Monday coming up. We're headed headlong into a Christmas season, and uh, we are dealing with the continual griping that many of us do about all the Christmas decorations being out before Thanksgiving is even over and all that. People have been preparing for the upcoming Christmas season since last Christmas, especially the merchants and all that other kind of stuff. There are probably people right here in this room that bought this year's Christmas presents last year in January because of all the big sales. Like, yeah, I, crazy, isn't it? You know, how we kind of go from season to season to season, and each one has its own joys, and each one has its own sorrows. And, you know, for many, the Christmas season is a magical, wonderful, glorious time of year. For some, it is a very challenging time of year. For some, there are memories of great and wonderful and glorious times. And because of the change of circumstances, the better Christmas was back in the day, the worse it is now because of the change that happens to us as we go along. Man, life comes at us, doesn't it? And we're going along and all of a sudden the world is entirely different. You know, life happens. And, uh, you know, we've all experienced some things. And if we live long enough, the, more, the longer we live, the more of the drama, the more of the trauma, the more of the pain, the more of the joys that we're able to experience. It's just life happens. And, uh, but in our modern American culture, the entire reason for celebrating Christmas is not entirely lost, but it sure is replaced. You know, I don't know how many Santas there are deployed around the country, thousands and thousands and thousands. Dennis is back on the East Coast being Santa, you know, right here from our midst to, to uh, you know, and he's had some interesting stories of, you know, little kids and stuff that have come and lots of stuff. But the, the reason for the season really gets shuffled to the back. Uh, the back of the line. You know, we've got family here now that have come and some have already come and gone. Uh, we have more family coming to try to be here for the, the holiday season. The particular date of Christmas is going to be put off for a day or two for our family because some of them can't be here uh, in a timely fashion, all that kind of stuff. But the Christmas story still is familiar you know, every year it is reenacted by all kinds of little kids in bathrobes being the angels and the shepherds and the wise men and, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. But the idea of God becoming flesh is somehow missed in the shuffle. So the Christmas story, when we think of the baby Jesus and the manger and all that stuff, is, is kind of perceived by many to be on the same level as the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny and, you know, Santa Claus and all of those kind of mythical things rather than real life. Well, so I want us to take a different look at Christmas this year, I mean, or at the, at the Christ event. I really don't even like the term because it just is not, I don't think, a very good term. But... The Christ event is worth celebrating, but it should be celebrated by believers with some knowledge. And everything that is got here somehow. Now, I want, I want to engage with you a little bit this morning about, I mean, look around. Here we are. We can see one another. We can reach out and touch one another. We can feel one another. We, can, we have emotions towards one another. All those things, so here we are, but everything that is got here somehow. That's pretty much a given, right? Uh, 
our perception or our belief about how everything got here is dependent upon our beliefs, our faith, if you will, one way or the other. And I want to explore a little bit that from the, from the big picture of God becoming man. The underlying principle of Christianity is that God is. And that he has revealed himself to mankind in a variety of different ways. And that's, you know, that's at the very core of, of our belief system, if you're a believer in Christ. God is. And he's revealed himself somewhat to us. There are four gospel accounts of the Christmas story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all have variation on the theme. But John, the beloved disciple, approaches it a little different. And I want to look at John's account to get us a broader picture. So in John chapter 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And uh, that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it, or did not comprehend it, or has not been able to extinguish it. There are several different kind of translations of that, but in the beginning was the Word, and Jesus is the Word. And of course, that becomes very clear as we move through that passage. But John goes back to the creation account. In, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 of the Bible, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and, and void, or formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now, John deliberately goes back to the very beginning. Now, here's some interesting things. God has no beginning, we're told, from everlasting to everlasting. Now, if you just want to blow your little mind, try pondering that for about an hour straight, and it'll, I mean, it just will rattle your cage. The idea that God always was. See, you and I are finite. We were born at a particular time. We can go back to our conception if we want to, and we were conceived at a moment in time. We're born at a particular time. We live in whatever environment we're born in, and sometimes we can change our environment. In America, we can move all over the place. We can go almost wherever we want to go, do you know, a lot of the things that we want to do. But we live in this environment wherever we are, and then there comes a point at which we die. We are finite. There's a beginning and there's an end. The idea of God that has no beginning and no ending, it just, I mean, that is mind-staggering. So... In the beginning of what? Well, in the beginning of this planet, in the beginning of this earth, in the beginning of mankind, you know, God created all this stuff. Now, how many other worlds has God created? Who knows? How many exist now? Who knows? You know, when, when our scientists that look through these telescopes and stuff and send stuff into outer space... It just goes on and on and on, essentially, infinitely. Well, if God has been forever, I mean, who knows what else is out there? But God's creative genius, we live on this planet. 
And in the beginning of this, which is the only thing we have as a reference from a beginning, God created all that is. That is a, a profound statement. Because it is a worldview that many today reject. So there's a lot of unanswered cosmic questions. Good gracious alive. If you're thinking at all, you got questions. You know, how did we get here? What is it all about? There's a lot, you know. And the Bible gives us the rudimentary answers that we long for, although it certainly doesn't tell us all of the answers to things we would like. Um, so, but for those of us who live 80 years, a lot of people never make that. But if you live 80, if you live 90, if you live to be 100, that is still just a blip. Just a bare little dot, even on the history of the world that we know of. To say nothing of the universe and all that stuff. So you, th you think you're really something? Well, maybe not. But on the other hand, if you think you're really nothing, you're everything to God. And both of those things are amazing truths. We're nothing, and yet we're everything. It's, it's an amazing thing. So, while some knowledge gets passed on from generation to generation, I'm amazed at how much smart people know. And I'm also amazed at how little smart people know. We have gadgets, and this last little while, being up at the hospital with, with Vicki and in other kinds of situations, man, we've got gadgets that can look right into your brain and see that there's a, something that doesn't belong there, and there are folks who can whack in there and pull it out sometimes, and, you know, I mean, we got machines that'll look and tell you that you got something in there that ought not to be, and other things where people can go in there and pull it out, you know what I'm saying, and amazing knowledge and yet the smartest guys in the room the neurologists the neurosurgeons and all the rest are completely incapable of saying what things are going to look like tomorrow no idea you know we can give our best guess from what we've seen, it looks like this could be the trajectory, and yet that changes. So we, there is some knowledge that gets passed on from generation to generation, but there are a whole lot of things for which we just don't have any answers, and nobody on earth does have answers. And we need to have the humility to realize we don't have them. You know, there has never been a wise person who believed that he had all the answers. Well, there are a whole lot of morons that think they have all the answers. <laughs> but there's never been a wise person that thought he had all the answers because the more we dig, the more we understand, people spend their whole life looking at one little subspecies of plant or animal and the people that dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and write doctoral dissertations on some unknown thing about the tsetse fly somewhere, you know, are the very ones to recognize how little we know. We need to grasp that God is beyond our comprehension. We have what he's revealed to us. We don't have what he's not revealed to us. And what he has not revealed to us is, of course, a great, great quantity. There are two main big streams of thought in our world regarding how we got here. And the worldview that is expressed in the Bible is that God created us. He created us in his own image. And then the Bible tells us all kinds of stuff about humanity, how we got where we are, about sin, about the brokenness, about our craziness, about our frailties, about our follies, all that stuff, and tells us how we can be fixed and redeemed and ready to live forever with the Lord, you know, in heaven. Now, the creation account, this is a, 
a stunningly simple account of amazingly complex systems. Think for just a second about the circulatory system alone. I mean, you got the heart pumping around, you got the blood flowing around, you got the veins, arteries, this stuff going down and coming back and circulating around. You know, just one little system, the plumbing of such a thing is beyond comprehension. You know, the smartest people we have might be able to take a little section out of one thing and put something else in there. But the design of this whole thing is absolutely incredible. Your eye, your brain, that you can look out here and see stuff and your brain tells you what it is. I mean, we are so amazingly complex that there is just no explanation in my uh, understanding but that God created us. And you can look at anything you want to look at in world, and, and it's the same thing. You can look at the smallest little amoeba or whatever, and the idea that, you know, I mean, God created all of this amazing stuff. You know, in Job chapter uh, 38, actually through about 40, there's a lot of interaction there, uh, of course, with his counselors and all that. But Job was kind of questioning God and his other guys that were giving him counsel were too. And so in Job 38, starting in verse 4, God is talking to Job and he says this, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Then, for the next several chapters, God asks a whole bunch of questions that if any of you have answers for, feel free to hop right in with them. You know? And then, in verse 40, uh, chapter 40, verse 1 through 5, you know, the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? I mean, come on, Job, you're going to tell me how things ought to be worked here? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Job was confronted with some of the questions that we face, if we think, and came up with no answers. And God has created us in his image with the spark of life, the spark of divinity, but also with our own limitations. We see a little bit. We don't see, you know, we can only see what we can see. You know, a quart jar can only hold a quart. You know, it doesn't hold a gallon, it holds a quart. And well, we in our human vessels will hold a certain things, but that's, you know, we are limited as well. So, now, one worldview, I say, is that God created us in his image. The other worldview, which is really amazingly popular today, is that everything just kind of came together by, by chance or accident, by amazing but entirely natural forces, whatever they are. Now, folks, I just don't have enough faith to believe that. You know, I just cannot believe that all this stuff just happened again. Look around. The idea that everything that has just randomly took place, I mean, where in the world could you see anything like that? I mean, it just, there's, it just makes no sense. No matter which perception you take, there are questions. But God at least gives us answers that point us to a reality greater than ourselves. How it happened cannot be explained, but clearly something generated life. And uh, man's knowledge and wisdom has no answers, but a lot of speculation. 
We can raise questions. But here, we are so crazy, so foolish sometimes, that just raising the question makes us think we're smart enough to have the answer. You know? I mean, all of the atheists or those who are rejecting God, just by raising these interesting questions, it, it seems to it cast doubt on the belief in God and the trust in God, even though there's no answers on the other side. It is a, a matter of undermining our belief. But both worldviews are statements of faith. Look, folks, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about, but we can believe certain things. Uh, and our worldview is hugely significant as we think about the Christ event. You know, why do we have Christmas? Why is it celebrated around the world? It's celebrated around the world as good news by those who are trusting in Christ. It's celebrated just as a worldly thing by many. But the reason that it's here is because Jesus broke into the world and he brought a whole new dimension of life, a dimension of hope, a dimension of purpose, a, 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 an understanding of something far beyond what we have here. So the Bible tells us that God has been preparing, God was preparing for the Christ event before creation ever even happened. Before he spoke the world into existence, God was planning ahead of time for the Christ event to happen. And that is a part of the mystery. But in Colossians chapter 1, you know, uh, before creation he was doing it, Colossians 1, starting with verse 15, he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Before mankind was even created, look, why has God chosen to create us this way? I don't know. You know, uh, my son writes a blog and he raises a lot of interesting and fascinating questions. Uh, he's had a whole series on, about God. And, but, but a lot of that is, you know, why didn't God foresee that if he created man in his own image, that they were going to screw it up? Well, as it turns out, he did foresee it. But he, gave, he created us with our own minds. He created us with creativity. He created us with the ability to think, to reason, to interact with, with one another, to interact even with him. Wouldn't it have been a lot easier if he had just made us robots? Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a world of robots somewhere, you know? where God has created other beings that they don't have any choice. They just, I don't know, whatever, sing holy, holy, holy all day. You know, I mean, I don't know why God has created us, but the scripture tells us that we are created in this way with all the abilities that we have, and Christ was in the beginning, and he has, before creation ever even came to pass, he was in the works. John 17, 5 says this, and John, uh, and Jesus was praying what we've come to call his high priestly prayer. And Jesus says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And in, in Philippians chapter 2, starting verses 5 through 8, he says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, 
did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He says, our attitude needs to be one of service, one of humility. The very business of arrogance and pride that somehow we are smart enough to counsel God. Look, I mean, every one of us have faced the death of loved ones. We've faced loss of relationships. We've faced pain. We've faced the loss of our body working right. We have all kinds of aches and pains and challenges. And we call upon God to heal us, and it's fine to do that. We should do that. It's appropriate to call upon the Lord for that. But when it comes to try to tell God what he ought to be doing, that's the very nature of our pride. And what we need is the attitude of Jesus that he says. That even though he was God, wrapped up in the flesh, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death. Man. So as we finish, go on with, with John's account, starting with verse 6. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness of the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, <clears throat> the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now this was written by, you know, he, John as he's writing was talking about John the Baptist when he talks about there was a man sent from God, his name was John. This is a different John, the Apostle John, who was with Jesus from early on. He beheld Jesus' glory. He saw him heal people. He saw him raise people from the dead. He saw him feed 5,000 people with a sack lunch. He saw him walk on the water. He was there at the Mount of Transfiguration when there was a glorious, stunning light. So when John says, we've seen his glory, you know, he was not just whistling Dixie. He was... He had seen the glory of the only begotten Son of God. He had seen then Jesus go to the cross. He had seen, he was at the cross, you know, and Jesus looked down from the cross, said, John, this is your mother, you know, said to his mother, this is your son, you know, take care of her, was the idea. And John had seen him ascend into heaven. After the, he'd seen him in the resurrected form, for a matter of around 50 days, he'd, he'd seen him be uh, taken up into heaven. So John knows what he's talking about, and he probably lived for 60 or 70 years beyond that and had opportunity to walk with Christ and by the Holy Spirit after Jesus even had ascended to the Father. So there's a lot of discussion in the scripture about the difference between light and dark. The light is when we receive the revelation of God to man. The darkness is when we rely only on human wisdom. It doesn't matter how smart people are. They're not smarter than God. And if they think they're smarter than God, it just shows how stupid they are is exactly what the Bible says. You know, whenever people begin to think that they are brighter or smarter than God, they've missed it all. One of the things going around in our world today is the idea that we are so much smarter. Yeah, those poor saps that wrote the Bible, you know, they knew a little bit and stuff, but man, we've evolved so much now. We are so much smarter. After all, we have computers or whatever it is that we have, you know? And that does not even begin to touch the wisdom of God. 
Jesus the light came into the world. The reason we celebrate Christmas, the Christ event, is that the light came into the world when there was hopelessness. There was very little understanding of anything after this life. Different cultures had come up with their own ideas and thoughts, but the light came in Christ to say, here's who you are, here's the reason you are, you're this way because of sin, you're this way because of rebellion, you're this way because of pride, but if you'll humble yourself and call on me, I'll forgive you. I'll wipe your sins out. And you can become my own sons and daughters by trusting in me, and you don't have to die. Yes, your physical body is going to fall away, but you, the essence of you, can live with me forever because of what the Christmas, the Christ event, has come to be. See, at Christmas, what we call Christmas, God brought spiritual light. And man, what a difference. All human beings are children of God by virtue of creation. All human beings have that spark of God. And you know, in a lot of places, I mean, even though people are not necessarily Christians, that doesn't mean that there are not kind people, you know, relatively good people, loving people, you know, give you the shirt off of their back people. There are a lot of Christian kinds of things that God has wired into the human DNA. You know, but there is also the brokenness and the fallenness, and all of us also have that. And that's why marriage is tough. That's why interpersonal relationships are hard. That's why we have been let down by people. And that's why we've let other people down. Because there is a broken side to us as well. And when Jesus came, the Word was made flesh and lived with us. He brought the light that says, trust me. Follow me. I will take you through this life with whatever comes. And I will bring you to live with me forever in that place that I have already prepared for you where there is no sin. There is no death. There's no darkness. You know, there is just the light of God. And so we... That is the big picture of why we even celebrate Christmas. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And this Word was made flesh in Jesus Christ, lived among us as an example, as the perfect sacrifice, covering all of our frailties, all of our brokenness, so that by our trusting in Him, we can have the blessed hope of eternity. Man, that is good news. That's why we celebrate the coming of Christ into the world. Has nothing to do with Santa Claus. Has nothing to do with giving presents to one another, although that has become the major event has nothing to do with spending money that we don't have for things that we don't need on people we don't even like in order, you know, I mean, there's a difference. Let's not forget in all of the worldly wisdom, in all of the worldly celebration. Let's remember the wonderful, amazing, joyful reason that we celebrate was because the light has come and we can come to the light. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you for watching. For questions on today's video, please reach out to us at www.flatheadecclesia.org.